nice to meet everyone. My name is Lucy Hibbespay. I work at Transport for London in the city planning department. Uh, I'm actually here to give you more of an overview of what London as a whole is doing towards um, air quality and addressing the air quality issues. So, first off, the, the interest in this, as you, that's why you're all here really, it's growing, um, it's growing incredibly. And the interest in it means that really we have to do something about it and it's actually putting extra pressure on everyone, which is great. So I'm not sure how much you learnt yesterday and whether you've seen maps like this before. I don't know if there's any nods around the room. So you might be aware of what the different colours mean. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a map showing air quality concentrations, specifically of nitrogen dioxide across London. And where it's yellow or red or darker red, we're exceeding the EU limit values. Does everyone know what the EU limit values are from yesterday? A few nods, a few shakes. <laughs> it's basically what the EU has uh, said is a safe level of nitrogen dioxide. So where it's yellow or red or above, this is an unsafe level for human health. So obviously we want the map to be blue, but at the moment it's got rather a lot of yellow and red on it. And just to give you some numbers about how it's affecting different groups of people as well. So it's actually affecting the areas that are the most deprived the worst. Um, so the top 10, top for September cents, sorry, of areas that are most deprived have 50% of the areas that exceed nitrogen dioxide levels. And the top 10 uh, least deprived areas have about 1%. So really it does affect those in most deprived areas the most. And you may have already heard about this as well, about where, what the sources are of the nitrogen dioxide. But really this is to emphasize that a lot of it comes from road transport. And of that, um, big culprits are diesel cars, and also TfL buses, because a lot of those are run on diesel as well. So what are we doing about it across London at the, the macro level? So I'm not sure how much you've heard also about the ultra-low emission zone. Hands up if you've heard of it. More or less, lots of people have. So initially, we started off with a precursor to the ultra-low emission zone, which is called the T-charge, or the toxicity charge. Um, and that, that was launched in October 2017. And that was just a £10 surcharge on just the most polluting vehicles. And then ULES came along earlier this year. Um, you may have heard of it when it was announced in March. And it operates 24 hours a day um, across the central area of London where the congestion charge operates. And you don't comply if you have a vehicle that's a Euro 4 petrol, or so older than a Euro 4 petrol <coughs> car, which was a vehicle produced in around 20, um, 2005 or 2006. That's actually quite an old vehicle. Um, or if you have a diesel car, because they are more polluting, um, the standard is, is a newer one, so you have to have a Euro 6 engine, which is, was made in 2015 or 2016. And there are various standards for motorcycles um, and other vehicles as well. So, um, yeah, I'll give you more information about ULES. So this is the sort of charges that um, are applied. And for the cars, it's around £12.50 a day. And this is on top of the congestion charge, if you have to pay the congestion charge, if you're eligible. Um, and then for heavier vehicles, it's £100 a day, so much more significant. And that's, that launched in March, and we first told the public about it around 2017. So very recently, in the last month, we issued um, a six-month on report to show what impact ULES is having in London. And it's actually been really great results. Um, so you can see, if you want to look at the detail of the slide above, basically, around 2017 um, is where you see the lines breaking there. And it's showing that um, since people have been aware of ULES, they've been, been beginning to change their vehicles. And now far more vehicles are complying with ULES, so they don't have to pay the extra charge. Um, and roadside nitrogen dioxide concentrations are 36% lower in July and September 2019 than they were in January to March 2017. So that's a huge difference. Um, a significant um, improvements considering there was quite a plateau before that. Um, and also to, to touch on the issues of what's happening around the boundary of ULES, and although there are concerns about um, there being potentially higher emissions around the boundary, the six month on report is actually showing no increases in nitrogen dioxide around the boundary. And this is partly because so many people are upgrading their vehicles and are becoming cleaner actually the overall picture for everyone is that we've got lower emissions everywhere. Oops, sorry. The, wh when what's happening next after the central London um, ultra-low emission zone is that we're going to introduce from October next year 
um, tightening of the existing low emission zone. Does everyone know about the low emission zone? It's a different thing. It applies to heavy vehicles, so lorries, um, those sorts of things. And it's been in existence for over 10 years. But we're going to tighten its standards so that those heavy vehicles have to be Euro 6, so much newer. Otherwise, they pay quite a hefty fine as well. So that's going to be introduced from October. And then from 2021, the ultra-low emission zone is expanding to the north-south circular. Fiona mentioned this briefly just earlier. Um, it's obviously going to affect far more people, um, but it's also going to have a huge impact as well. So um, it's going to protect, uh, especially try to improve areas where there's hot spots, where there's still some pollution, despite the fact that all the other vehicles are upgrading. So some statistics, sorry, on um, what sort of impacts we're going to see from all these changes. Over 100,000 fewer people will be living in areas that exceed the nitrogen dark side levels. There will be a 77% reduction London-wide and a 97% reduction in outer London, especially. And then far fewer schools, I think I saw that only like one school left after all of this in 20, 2025 that will still be in an area near an exceedance of the um, limit value. And then we're also putting in place quite a few mitigating actions. So uh, we announced a scrappage scheme so that people can come and scrap their old vans um, earlier in the year. And we've just announced that there's going to be another scheme, um, a fund of 23 million, where people can come and scrap their cars and motorcycles that don't comply. It won't be for absolutely everyone because there's a limited pot. Um, so the car and motorcycle one is limited to people who are on lower incomes or um, have disability benefits. Um, and then we'll also have some retrofit options available for people. And also we're doing a lot of marketing and make, pointing people towards what would be compliant vehicles. And there's a lot of other stuff going on at TfL. I'm not going to cover it all in much detail. Um, but the buses, we're gonna, we've pledged that um, all single-deck buses in London, central London will be electric by 2020. And all the ones in, in the central zone are uh, at least um, Euro 6 at the moment as well. Um, we're funding various transport schemes through the Mayor's Air Quality Fund, as the name of a, a um, specific fund the Mayor set up, the Neighbourhoods of the Future and Low Emission Neighbourhoods. Those are all names of specific funding pots that boroughs can apply for. Uh, there's stakeholder engagement programmes such as Low City to try and make the freight industry aware of the low emission zone tightening rules, etc. Um, we've also done quite a lot with taxis because taxis was also quite a big chunk of that pie chart I showed you earlier. Uh, recently, we've announced that the taxis have to have quite a strict age limit. They already had an age limit where once they reached uh, 15 years, they would, were no longer a, could no longer, longer license with us. We're slowly reducing that down to 12 years. So they have to be newer, so there will be um, lower emissions. Uh, and all the new ones that are licensed from, from since January 2018 have to be zero emissions capable as well. So we've actually got two, two and a half thousand electric or zero emissions capable black cabs out in London already, which is great. Uh, we're also doing trials to do with buses for wireless charging. And uh, it's already been, already been mentioned, the electric vehicle uh, infrastructure, lots of charging points. We at TfL are putting in uh, 300 across London by the end of 2020. We're already around 217, I think, was the last count. And then quite a lot of lamppost charges as well through the Go Ultra Low City scheme. I'm not sure if people have talked about that already, but that's the name of a scheme where uh, boroughs can apply for funding for charging points. So, just to sum up, this is the current situation as I showed you, and statistics show there that you know, lots and lots of people are living in areas of exceedance. This is what we want to get to in 2025. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, obviously it's going to need a lot of help from everyone, and we really need to also target specific um, hotspots there. But um, come 2025, we've done modelling calculations to show this is what it ought to look like if everything goes to plan. Uh, we'd have almost no primary or secondary school. I think there is still one, but I'm sure that's quite right. Um, and then about 2% of road kilometers in London still exceeding the nitrogen dioxide levels. And it's really hard to tackle those that last 2%. They're really tricky to get. Um, but we have a yeah, gap in air quality between high and low income areas of London reduced by 71%. So there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of stuff which will make things a lot better in the background. But it doesn't mean that um, certainly there's lots that can still be done in the local area that will make it a lot better for residents here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm here today to talk about uh, active travel and behavior change. 
So Lucy talked a lot about the work, the good work that TfL is doing in terms of vehicles and trying to get that to electric. But the other side is to actually think about getting more people to walk and cycle as well. It's a low cost and healthy option. And so essentially, for starters, what is active travel? Active travel is walking, cycling, people scooting, people with buggies, um, people with mobility aids. And now it's also expanding as well. So there's electric scooters. I think, I guess that's pretty much active travel in some form. Um, and then you've got electric bikes as well, which you do still need to pedal, but it's uh, not a, it's electric assisted. So why do we focus on active travel? That um, image on the right over there is some research that TfL did, and it's part of the Mayor's Transport Strategy. Essentially, they estimate that if all Londoners walked or cycled for 20 minutes a day, this would save 1.7 billion pounds in NHS treatment uh, costs over the next 25 years. Yellow oh. cards, uh, just to slow down a bit. Um, question. Um, we'll come to um, questions a little bit later, so if you just uh, jot it down on a post-it and there'll be an opportunity in the Q&A. Cool, thanks. Um, that graph over there also shows the, uh, the reduction in costs and in illnesses <laughs> if um, London is switched over to 20 minutes of active travel. Uh, per day. So essentially, we promote walking and cycling because for two reasons. One is there's a physical inactivity crisis in London and actually in the most of the developed world generally where people aren't doing enough exercise and one way to counter that is to do more exercise through travel. The second side to that is that the way that we move, our, the, the way that we use the transport network with a lot of people driving um, creates air quality issues, which is essentially what we're here to talk about today. So I thought I'd quickly um, go through the Mayor's transport strategy targets for 2041. So they want 80% of all trips in London to be made by walking, cycling and public transport. 70% of Londoners to be doing at least 20 minutes of active travel uh, daily, so that's walking and cycling. A reduction in um, killed or seriously injured collisions, so that will, that's against the baseline from 2005 and 2009, and 2010, 2014 as well. Um, three million fewer daily car trips across London, and a quarter of a million fewer cars a 10 to 15% reduction in overall traffic levels, and the London Transport Network to be on track to be zero emission by 2050. So you can see with these uh, Mayor's Transport Strategy targets, a lot of it, I think, focuses on people turning to walking and cycling more, to more active travel more often. So what does this mean for Kingston if we want to achieve that 80% uh, mode share for walking, cycling, and public transport. So this is um, some stats that TfL have, but essentially they estimate that there's about 280,000 trips per day in Kingston. 37% of that is um, by walking and cycling, and 21% by public transport. To achieve the Mayor's Transport Strategy objective of 80% walking, cycling, and public transport uh, mode share, you'd need a mode shift. So 22% of trips that are currently driven would need to be by walking, cycling, or public transport. That sounds like quite a lot, but when you think about it at a person at an individual level, that means that just one in five of your trips need to, um, one in five of your motorized trips need to be by active or public transport. Not really that hard, this could be for short trips to school, to the shops, to visit family and friends. So I think I, this is what I want you to take away today is if we want to achieve that uh, target mode share that the uh, Mayor and Transport for London are after, it's one in five trips essentially for most people in Kingston. Um, what I want to do as well is just briefly touch on behaviour change. So this is, now we know what our target is, what we're trying to achieve. What tools do we have at our disposal to, um, to achieve that behavior change? So 
There's, you can encourage people to reduce the number of trips that they make. They can retime it, so you could make your trip at less congested times of the day. You can remode, so that's that shift from driving to walking, cycling, and public transport. Or you can reroute, so you can encourage people to use less congested um, parts of the transport network. What I want to focus on is the remote because that's where there is a big opportunity. So this is um, years ago I did a travel behaviour change plan for the city of Gold Coast in Australia. And essentially when you're thinking about trying to change people's behaviour there's five key groups. And that's that state of change on the left there. So there's people that are pre-contemplating. They, and that's someone who hasn't really thought about changing the behavior at all. They're quite happy with the way things are. There's contemplation, so they'd be open to the idea but haven't really taken the necessary steps yet to try something different. And then preparing, so these people have decided that they want to do it and they're, they're getting ready to make that behavior change. So when I'm talking about behavior change, this is people who, it could be anything, so from switching from one mode to another. So maybe you drive at the moment, you're looking at walking more or trying to cycle more. Um, so in terms of the actions that you could do for the people who are pre-contemplating or contemplating changing their behavior, it is about raising awareness of the alternatives to them. Why should they change? What does it, what's, the, what's the improvement? Why is their life going to be better if they change their behavior? For, pre for preparing, that's really about providing the skills and the motivation to try a different um, method of travel. And the uh, Kingston Council do that through things like cycle skills training, um, the doctor bike events that they've got. So that really encourages people to try something new. Um, then there's action. So these are people who are actively engaged in trying to change their behavior. And this really, it's about providing the opportunities. So is there, are there infrastructure opportunities that you can do to help them out? And then the last bit is maintaining. So these are people, they're already, they're doing the desired behavior. So they're probably cycling to work every day. So what can you do for them? It's about rewarding them. It's about making them feel validated so that they don't slip back into some undesired um, behavior. Uh, <clears throat> so this is from the Kingston Cycling Report. And on the left is, are the reasons why people cycle at the moment, and on the right are the barriers to cycling. So if you think back to the, f the four R's, the reducery time, um, and you think about the, um, those five states of change, what you really want to be doing is um, maximizing the reasons why people cycle, so doing activities and initiatives that encourage and promote that, and then looking at activities and initiatives that will um, help people overcome the barriers to cycling. And if you look at it, the main one is that people are fe um, fear of being in a collision, too much traffic, and prefer other modes of transport. So really, when we're thinking about trying to promote active travel, those are probably the top three um, barriers that you should be trying to overcome. And I, th I think that's it, thank you.